make it today. Okay, so well, good afternoon everyone and um, well, good evening to those um, dialing in from over in the eastern states and um, yeah, thanks very much for joining us today. Um, this isn't quite what we envisaged in terms of delivering the results to you. Um, I can assure you that we'd much prefer to be down uh, with you all at the Green Range Country Club today. But um, given the recent COVID developments, it's made it very difficult. Um, so we decided that a Zoom meeting uh, would be the safest option for delivery given, uh, given the circumstances. However, if COVID allows, we're hoping to get to the Southwest to present the inaugural HYC awards later in the year. So my name is Rachel Hamilton and I work very closely with Nick Paul and the crew at Fire Australia. And it's my absolute pleasure to be able to facilitate today's uh, meeting for you. Um, so like I said, just as a heads up, I am recording the meeting and it will be posted on the Fire Australia website later this evening um, and it will be accessible under resources if you'd like to look back or if you know anyone else that um, would like to access the meeting details. So the idea of today's meeting is to provide you with the trial results from our Esperance and Albany Crop Technology Centres and also the Coconut site which hosts a number of canola trials. So the two projects that will be um, that the centres host um, are thanks to GRDC investments, and they are the High Rainfall Zone Farming Systems Project and the uh, more recent Hyper Yielding Crops Initiative. So the High Rainfall Zone Farming Systems Project is led by DPERD in collaboration with CSIRO leading the canola research, with Fire Australia leading the cereals research element. The Hyper Yielding Crops Project is led by Fire Australia with a number of collaborators nationally, which Nick Paul will share with you shortly. But most importantly for this region, we've collaborated with our regional partner, Stirlings to Coast Farmers. So today we're delighted to have Dr. Jens Berger joining us from the CSIRO. And Jens is going to be talking to us about canola nutrition and agronomy and sharing his learnings from the 2020 season. We're also um, fortunate to have Jeremy Kerry joining us from DPIRD. And Jeremy's been looking at the comparisons between winter and spring barley germplasm and different agronomic management practices. And he'll be sharing with us what's performed good and perhaps not so good over the season. We've then got Fire Australia's Managing Director, Nick Paul, who will be joined by our very own James Rollison, um, who's a field research officer down in the Southwest. James has been responsible for all the trials across the Albany and Esperance Crop um, Technology Centres and he'll provide us with a quick recap on the season's weather and cultivar performance across the two sites. And then Nick and James will let us know what the effects soil amelioration had on wheat under different levels of management. And last but not least, we've got Phil Mackey joining us from Stirlings to Coast Farmers. And Phil will share with us his findings from the high yielding crops focus farms and also provide us with a heads up on how you can get involved in the focus farms, farms and the HYC awards next season. Um, I'd just like to quickly acknowledge um, John Blake, GRDC Western Panel Member, and Josh Johnson, GRDC's Manager for Agronomy Soils and Farming Systems here in the West, and thank them for joining us today. And once again, thanks to the GRDC, GRDC for investing in these um, two very important projects. Um, finally, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Kenton Porker, who's joined us online today. Um, Kenton's currently involved in some of the barley research for the Hyper Yielding Crops project. He's currently working with Saadi, but Fire Australia is delighted to have him joining the team as new research director in early March. So thanks for joining us, Kenton. I'll open up questions at the end of each presentation if we have the time. Um, if not, there will be some time at the end of the session, um, but to assist the presenters, if you could please mute your audio throughout the presentations and then feel free to turn it on um, when prompted or use the chat button in the Zoom um, application if you, if you prefer to ask questions that way. Um, so thanks for listening. Please just bear with me while I share my screen and I'm going to hand over to Nick Paul, who will provide a quick snapshot of the two GRDC investments. Okay, over to you, Nick. Hopefully that's worked. Lovely. Thank you very much, Rachel, and thank you for the introduction. Um, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, fantastic uh, to uh, share the screen with you, so to speak. Um, as Rachel said, not really the way we'd envisage to do this, but uh, 
needs must, unfortunately. And so, um, like I say, uh, logistics um, probably over this last 14 days have been reminiscent of the last 365 days because in fact, the site that's uh, pictured in the slide there is actually the Esperance Crop Technology Center just north of Esperance. And James and I were effectively marking that out uh, almost exactly a year ago today, um, how things have changed in a year. Um, I wanted to say that we've brought two GRDC investment projects together. Uh, the first being the WA high rainfall zone. And as uh, Rachel's already said, we've got a great team um, within the deeper, it's a project led by deeper, the WA high rainfall zone farming systems project, uh, working with CSIRO. And it, we can't do justice to all of the elements uh, because the CSIRO element is very much involved, uh, a strong modeling of exactly what's happening within the high rainfall zone of WA. Um, but Jens has kindly joined us today and is talking about the canola uh, aspect of the project, which uh, CSIRO lead, but in which Jeremy, I know, has also had a site running uh, at Esperance. So that's one aspect uh, that we'd like to share with you. And James and I will be talking about some of the wheat work from that project. And uh, the, the second project is one that's been very specific to the Albany port zone. Um, and I should point out that farming systems project has been a project that's carried both at the Esperance port zone and the Albany port zone. And uh, there's a related project that involves the Sequa Farming Group and also Stirlings to Coast. The second project's the Hyper Yielding uh, Crops Project, and we've been absolutely thrilled to uh, be able to lead this, not least because it's a national project um, and it involves some absolutely tremendous um, collaborating partners. And I think one of the things special for WA that I'd point out with regards to, well, what's the difference between those two, because we're put, trying to push boundaries with both of those projects, is that within the farming systems project, we tried to look at this aspect of probably one of the most exciting things that's happened since the no-till revolution, and that's soil amelioration in the West. And so the farming systems project is very much looking at the interaction of agronomy on top of soil amelioration. Whereas the hyper yielding project is assuming we've already made that leap to ameliorated soils and therefore is looking at the different agronomy levers on top of an ameliorated soil. Or certainly a soil that we believe has the chances of uh, really uh, maximizing yield. So any of the serial work that we're going to show you this evening has an element of either being conducted on ameliorated land or a comparison of the two. Okay, Reg, just to ch change the slide for me. Uh, the hyper yielding crops project, like I say, is, is, is the largest project that the organization for Australia has ever taken on. We've got actually some 11 collaborating partners and it's got really three elements, five research centers in five states. And those five research centers have the ability to pull all of the agronomic levers that we think are important in wheat, barley, and canola. It's fair to say that with some budgetary restrictions, some sites may only actually have two crops as opposed to three. And so for example, in 2020, we only focused on barley in the Albany Zone. So we've got the research centres, we've then got the associated focus farm strips, and we're really pleased that we've got Phil Mackey on board uh, from Stirlings to Coast to effectively try and scale that up in the region, and that's under uh, the national coordinator that we've put in place for that element of the project, uh, a gentleman by the name of John Midwood, 
who I know just like myself itching to get over uh, to the West. And finally, the third element, the HYC awards. And um, uh, hopefully we can inspire people that to sort of create that community of interest around trying to improve productivity as a group learning exercise in the different uh, regional environments. But this project is primarily, hyper yielding is primarily based in the high rainfall zone or what uh, we might class as the high rainfall zone now and then in some places. So that's a little about the hyper yielding project and I'll hand back um, to Rachel at that stage so we can move to James. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Nick. Okay, I'm gonna hand over to um, James, who's just gonna provide an overview of the two sites. Um, okay, is that all good, James? Can you see your slides? No worries. <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you, Raj. Okay. Um, so I just want to give you a brief overview of the two sites we had. Um, in 2020, Far Australia had the two research sites, as Nick said, one at Green Range, thank you to Scott Smith, and the one at Gibson. Uh, I'd like to thank the Whiting family for that one. Uh, next slide, Reg. So this is just a brief overview of the two sites. Um, both sites are the first serial after canola. Um, start with Albany. It's a shallow duplex over sand. Scott clayed it in 2017, um, putting approximately 400 tonnes to the hectare of clay on top of that. And then it was only smudged in 2019, 2020. Um, Phil Mackey and myself sowed that site on the 1st of May. It was incredibly dry and it was a shallow sowing. I think it only went in about one to one and a half centimetres. We planted all of the barley at 200 seeds to the metre squared, um, along with some MAP down the tube from Scott. We had the two harvest dates at Green Range, the first and the towards the end of November, um, which was most of the barley. And then the second harvest date, which was the wheat and the second half of the PGR and the elite screen, because it had some long winters in it. And then as per Esperance, um, it was sown into really good moisture on the 16th of April, where we put the small plots in and the amelioration work, which was sown with commercial gear. And then we came back and stitched in the second time of sowing trial. That too was sown at 200 seeds to the metre squared, just with um, a custom blend that the Whiting family had on farm. Harvest dates for Esperance, as you can see, November, early November and early December. Um, and our growing season rainfall is down the bottom there. So Green Range did get a little bit more rain throughout the season, but it was just the timing of it that was a true difference. Thanks, Rach. So looking at the Met data for Green Range last year, um, as you can see, we had that big rain event at the start of August. Prior to that, it was quite dry. Um, we did receive, um, sorry, where have we gone? Um, so we received 15 mils six days after it was sown, which was a bit of a blessing. Um, but then it was quite dry throughout May, June, and July as it looks. October was particularly dry for Green Range. Thanks, Rach. So looking at July in a bit more detail, um, it, it looks very dry, but as it turns out, it, we actually received almost 75% of the long-term mean for July. So although it doesn't seem like we got a lot of rain, there was 57 mils that fell throughout July um, on particular days, um, but it was still quite dry as opposed to August on the next slide, Roach. So within three days, um, yeah, we received almost 80% of the rainfall for August. So the site went from extremely dry to sitting under a fair bit of water for a few days. Um, and then the rest of August was quite dry, as you can see there. Thank you, Rach. So <laughs> Green Range did start off as a decile one season, as you can see. 
and it was it was only until August when it really changed. Um, and considering that we the site finished up with 476 mils for the growing season, you can see that's up around the decile eight that we finished. Thanks, Raj. Compare that to Esperance. Um, we did have less rain, so we had 56 mils less for the growing season. Admittedly, April is in there as well because uh, small plots were sown on the 16th of April. Um, but the timing of the rainfall was a lot better at Esperance. Um, considering the amelioration work we did with the ripping and the spading and sowing into a nice moisture profile, the crop at Esperance never really ran out of moisture. Like it just looked good and it didn't look thirsty all year. It did also receive a fair bit of rain in August, but yeah, not quite as much as um, Scott received. Thanks, Rach. Um, when I mentioned earlier that the site at Scott's had been smudged, smudging is a uh, spreading the clay and just trying to level out the hot spots of clay used with a grader board. Scott, you might not have actually seen that picture before. Um, but yeah, just trying to take the hot spots out of the clay and spread it around a bit so that you've got a nicer bed to sow into. So this is a site of Green Range. Photo on the left is um, some nice looking trip lines that Phil put in for me. When, and you can really see that clay line that stands out. So it's running east-west through the paddock. And then um, I've bridged that line for the site for the high rainfall zone wheat project where we mirror image to trial on the clayed and the unclayed. And then you can really see that unclayed line on 29th of July and just how much it stands out. That's right. So just a quick overview of some of the yields that we got at Albany. Um, to everyone's surprise, Roslyn topped the charts and actually um, out yielded Planet. Um, Roslyn looked pretty good all year, but yeah, we just sort of had in the back of our minds that Planet was going to top the charts, but it didn't at Albany. So respectively, Roslyn 6.42 tonnes to the hectare in the G by E by M trial. And then as for the wheat at Albany, it was Scepter in the uh, clade trial that was the highest yielder at 3.96 tonnes the hectare, followed by a line from Kevin Young at 3.88 tonnes to the hectare. In regards to Esperance, um, with a better season, HV8 Nitro um, topped the charts in the barley at 7.23 tonnes to the hectare. Nitro looked good all year, um, but I certainly wouldn't have picked it either to out yield planet. And then for the wheat, Cutlass uh, just got one over Illibo at Esperance. Thanks, Raj. Any questions? No, no questions. Can I ask uh, the opinion? Sorry, Rach, I've got my video off. I'll just put my video on again. Um, I, I'd love to ask the locals um, whether it's a growing season rainfall that takes on board any of that November moisture or whether in fact it's just in April to October because it makes a profound difference on both sets of figures this year. Is there a, is there a view? Growing season rainfall never seems to say October and half of November or such like, but I would have fancied that uh, the reality was it was more uh, uh, an October finish, but what's the local wisdom there? Uh, Nick, I would say most years early November rainfall is useful for us, for our crops. Yep. yep. So I would count maybe the first half. Yeah. Of okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Any, any, other, any other views? Uh, John? Nick. Yeah, Nick, just uh, 
the comparison between the wheat and the barley, the the barley mostly would have been finished uh, late later late October, early November. The wheat was hanging on, so there there is a difference in the growing season rainfall. I think for the two crops. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Does was anybody else blown away with the difference between wheat and barley? We're used to a ton, a ton and a half, but we were not used to uh, two tons plus. Is that is that a is that just something you see every year? Uh, I, Nick, I, I think a lot of it might be at our site might have been lack of plant numbers from that early um, seeding um, and have the capacity to till them all. Uh, but it's, a, it's normally at least a ton difference yep. where we are, I think. Yep. Okay. Back to you, Rach. Okay, yep. All right. Thank you. Thanks, James. Okay. Um, Jeremy, um, you're up next. So I'll just start your presentation. Yep. Okay. Uh, very cool. And um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I just want to acknowledge, first of all, um, how much I've enjoyed being involved with both the high rainfall zone and the hyper yielding projects. Um, so thanks to GRDC for their investment and for Fire Australia for bringing Deep Earth on board the hyper yielding. And likewise, in the high rainfall zone project, our other collaborators in CSIRO and Sterling's to Coast and Sepwell. Um, so as mentioned today, I'm going to talk about, I suppose, um, barley management, particularly with ref uh, respect to um, the different genotypes we might grow. Um, and are there synergies between these varieties and the management with due respect for the high rainfall zone um, environment um, that we can exploit those synergies to maximise production? So you can probably skip uh, to the next slide, please, Rachel. Um, so this, this trial I'm going to talk about is um, was located at Green Range uh, last year. Uh, and the next slide, please, Rachel. Um, so as mentioned, we've looked at variety by management packages. So the three varieties we sowed at the trial, um, we've got Rosalind and RGT Planet. So most people were probably familiar, familiar with those two as spring barley varieties. Um, Rosalind certainly the bent yield benchmark in WA for most of the WA, except in the high rainfall zone where, as James alluded to, we typically expect RGT Planet to take the bickies. Um, and then we've got the interesting comparison there with Cassiope, which is a European winter barley. Um, so really looking at um, can these longer developing types have a fit in WA? And if they do, do they require different management? Um, against those three varieties, we ran two fungicide packages. Um, you can see the details there, but essentially one was a standard, um, a standard package just based on a two spray. Um, and then we went to the high, um, higher input fungicide package, which had the seen treatment and just some slight variations on the fungicides there as well. Um, against the varieties and the fungicide packages, we then ran what we'd call, what we've called canopy manipulation treatments, but it's essentially um, different nutrition, um, defoliation and plant growth regulated um, treatments, whereby we might be able to manipulate the canopy to make it grow larger, shorter, um, take away some biomass and change how the plant grows and see if we can see some synergies with the, um, the genotypes and how they grow there. Um, so the control is basically the nutrition that was applied to the site by Scott. Um, the second treatment was an additional 50 units of nitrogen at the start of stem elongation. Um, we then compared both of those to whether a mechanical defoliation to sort of simulate the impact of grazing. Um, so in this case, James um, did many laps with a lawnmower um, and with an additional 50N. And finally, the impact of modus evo, so plant growth regulator, whether that would give us any benefit in this season. Um, next slide, please, Rachel. So the variety of responses that we saw, um, as James alluded to, the Rosalind in this trial was the highest yielding at the site, achieving six and a half tonnes per hectare. And it was about half a tonne per hectare higher than RGT Planet. Um, and you can see that both of those, the two spring varieties, um, yielded well, uh, well in excess of that of Cassiope, the winter barley. If we flick to the next slide, um, we can have a look and see that 
between Rosalind and Planet, the increase in yield was reflected in the increase of biomass at the end of the season. So both the varieties had a very similar harvest index, um, but Rosalind was able to have more biomass and in, as a result, a higher yield. Um, but I suppose when we look at those two varieties, they did yield pretty similarly. And I think everyone would agree really well considering the tough season at Green Range. Um, but if we flick to the next slide, we can have a look at how they actually formed their yield. Um, so if we look at the head density, so these are uh, tiller counts taken at the end of the season. And you can see that Rosalind actually had over a thousand heads per square metre. Um, RGT Planet, on the other hand, was just in the higher 700s. So that's 30% lower than that achieved by Rosalind. Um, on the other hand, uh, Planet had plumper grain by about three milligrams, and it also had more grains per ear, which although we would expect it, um, uh, we do expect that sort of relationship. Um, and that's how Planet typically compensates for its lower tiller number. Um, when you put all those calculations together, you end up with the yield that we achieved at that site um, for those two varieties respectively. If we were gonna talk about, I suppose the, um, what might the yield components look like if we were to achieve hyper yielding crops, let's say the 10 tonne target that we've talked about a lot in this project. And if we flick to the next slide, I don't have a 10 tonne trial to show, but we do have a trial that achieved just over eight tonnes a couple of years ago um, through the GRDC and Deep Herd Barley Agronomy Project. And at Gibson in that year, Planet achieved over eight tonnes per hectare of yield. But what was quite interesting at that site is that it wasn't through tiller number that Planet achieved that yield it actually had less tillers than um, that of the planet at green range, but where it made up for it was a, a far superior grain weight, an extra four milligrams uh, per seed, but in particular, the grains per ear. So an extra seven grains per ear. And in that trial, there were even treatments that had up to 30 grains per ear in planet. Um, so I suppose if we were looking towards 10 tonnes per hectare yields, um, the grain weight, uh, that's reasonably high at 44 milligrams. So having those grains per ear and the heads per square metres, and in effect, increasing your grain number per square metre is where we need to get to. So maybe um, through some, some manipulation of tiller number and grains per ear um, is the avenue to get there. And that's what we're really trying to change um, within these spring varieties with our um, management treatments. Uh, so next slide, please, Rachel. So I've mentioned what worked well in this season. It was Rosalind. Um, it was high biomass through high tiller number. Um, but what particularly didn't work well was the Cassiope. Um, so you can see that despite it being a winter type and it being much slower to develop, um, it, it still ended up with lower biomass at the end of the season. And in addition to having lower biomass, it was also had a lower harvest index. So it was less efficient at um, partitioning resources into grain yield at the end of the year. And if we look at how, why that might be the case as we fix the next slide, James has already um, run us a bit through the season, but as you can see, um, typically characterised by most of the rainfall or a great proportion of the rainfall occurring in August and um, maybe somewhat into September as well. Um, the key months, I suppose, when we typically expect our crops to start flowering and pretty important months to building grain yield. And if we flick to the next slide and have a look at where our three varieties actually were as we reached that August period. So this photo was taken on the 30th of July. And you can see on the left-hand side planet, although it's a bit stunted because it was quite uh, uh, stressed by the lack of water early in the season, it's actually at the third node stage and making its way through stem elongation. On the right-hand side, you can see Rosalind. And you, if you look closer, you might be able to see a couple of small flag leaves. So it sort of made its way through um, stem elongation into the booting stage. Whereas in comparison, the Cassiope, sown on the same day is still in the vegetative phase. So as we're going through into the most important months of the season, um, Cassiope is still a long, long way to go in terms of development. And if we flick to the next slide and have a look at when the head emergence was, was for these three varieties, you can see that Rosalind and Planet, the heads emerged in late August and early September. Um, so once again, hopefully have a full bucket in that time of year, most years. Um, seeing as we're coming out of winter and some nice mild but sunny September days to fill grains um, before, as um, John pointed out, you know, probably running out of grain filling time towards the end of October, early November. If you look at Cassiope, however, um, it didn't actually reach head emergence till the early October. Um, so not only is that occurring in a dry, typically drier and warmer period of the year, 
Um, but we know in WA we've got terminal drought on coming in, towards the end of November uh, or even mid, mid or early November in some years. And so Cassiope hasn't given itself much time to fill the grains that it's hopefully built. Um, just to preempt the question that someone might be thinking, which is, yes, but this is, it's Cassiope and it's a winter barley um, and you've sown it on the 1st of May. So what would happen if you sowed it earlier? And if we flick to the next slide, uh, this is some more data from the Barley Agronomy Project where we looked at the, um, in this case, the date of awn emergence, but it could um, typically be used as a surrogate for head emergence of Rosalind and Planet. And you can see that as you delay sowing time, or conversely move sowing time earlier, you can really influence the date of awn emergence of these spring varieties. But as we flick to the next slide, we can't actually do that with Cassiope. Its fertilization requirement means that um, even as we move sowing into early April, and probably if we kept going into March, um, its awn emergence is still gonna be in September. The head's gonna come out in late September. And once again, it's not leaving itself that much time to fill the grains and make use of the biomass that is grown. And if we flick to the next slide, I suppose this is just a point that when we tested uh, 30 different varieties in 2018, you can see that there's a huge difference between the spring varieties, the big bulk of uh, lines we've got down the bottom, and the four winter barleys that we tested in that season for their response uh, to sowing date. And as part of this hyper yielding crops project, we're really looking for any unique germplasm that might fit in that in between. Um, blank area where we might be able to sow them early. Um, they hold back somewhat in their development, but not so much as the winter European winter types that we've tested thus far. Question, Jez, can you remember what cultivars those winters were? Yeah, so those four there was Cassiope, Surge, Maltese, and Salamander. Um, and a few of them have been tested. I know Kenton um, tested a few of them before, um, yeah. Um, so moving on to the next slide, please, Rachel. Um, yeah, so that was the variety talk. I suppose we, the key message there is really that the springs were the king, and in particular, Rosalind with its high tiller number and higher biomass took, um, took the chocolates, um, and really Cassiope looked like it was too long um, for our environment. But what about the management strategies that we employed? Um, so if we move to the next slide, please, Rachel, we can have a look at the fungicide treatment. So... Um, really looking at the standard fungicide package versus the high input. And we can see that putting on the high input fungicide package, we actually saw a yield response of 340 kilos a hectare. And if we flick to the next slide, we can see that that was also reflected in the biomass. So although these two fungicide packages had the exact same harvest index, um, the high input fungicide package retained more biomass to harvest and um, converted some of that into extra grain yield. I should point out as well, there weren't many significant interactions between variety and fungicide. Um, but regardless, this, this result certainly surprised me. Um, and I won't speak for James, but I, I suggest he'd be thinking the same thing because during the season, while there was disease at the site, particularly in the unsprayed plots, um, in this trial, even the standard fungicide package really kept the disease um, really quite low throughout the season. So I probably wasn't expecting much of a response to fungicides. But if we flick to the next slide, one thing we really did notice was the green leaf area retention in the high input fungicide plots. So these two photos are of RGT Planet on the 1st of October. So um, in the midst of its grain filling period, and the only difference between these two plots was the um, fungicides applied. And on the left-hand side, you can see the necrosis of the lower leaves and even some leaf tipping in the upper leaves um, of the planet. Whereas on the right hand side with the high input fungicide, a much greener canopy all throughout. So potentially whether that green leaf area retention um, uh, enabled that crop to put on a bit more biomass and retain some of that biomass and convert it into yield at the end of the season, potentially some of the fungicide response we saw, given that we didn't have a high disease presence. Um, and if we move to the next slide, please, Rachel. Yeah, so just finally, I'll talk about those four canopy what we've called canopy manipulation treatments. Um, the first was sort of the control. So really just looking at the nutrition that Scott applied to the site. Um, that was our control base level at 87 units. And you can see that that yielded five and a half tonnes per hectare. Um, and about half of that was applied near seeding. And then the other half held on until the season turned around in August. So a bit, a bit plain season. Um, if we move to the next slide and compare that to when we added an additional 50 units of N at the start of semi-elongation, 
we can see that adding more N um, at that stage didn't provide any yield benefit. They were um, not statistically different. And so the key thing there is that um, in, in this season, adding the 50 N only, in, only served to increase grain protein by about 1%. Um, if we move to the next slide, we can have a look at the defoliation treatment. Um, and you can see that, yes, there was a negative yield response of the defoliation um, by about 240 kilograms per hectare. It could be questioned whether that is a true negative response because of the fact that um, it was such a poor start to the season. The fact that the response was only 240 kilos and potentially we've, we've been able to um, get some useful feed um, without detrimentally impacting yield could also be seen as a positive um, in such a dry start. And then the final, if we move to the next slide, the PGR treatment did actually slightly negative increase, negatively impact yield as well. Um, so just to summarize the canopy manipulation treatments, um, no impact on biomass and really inconsistent impacts on height as well. Um, so given that we weren't able to impact height, we weren't really expecting huge responses um, to these treatments. And once again, there weren't really many significant variety interactions either. Um, if we can move to the next slide, please, Rachel. I won't talk um, about the Esperance trial in detail, um, but it was a similar trial, except with a mid-April sowing, as um, James talked about briefly before. Um, and really the key points here is that in this site, Rosalind and Planet were pretty similar yield, equal yield um, statistically to nitro. And so it'll be interesting to interrogate that and see whether Planet was able to hold one or two more grains per head um, and how it formed that extra bit of yield um, to be more competitive with Rosalind in 2020. Um, although, as James mentioned as well, in a typical season, we would almost expect Planet to out-yield Rosalind at those yield levels. Um, Cassiope was poor once again, but the real disappointment for me was Urambi. Um, the longer maturing variety, uh, longer than Planet and Rosalind, I thought would be a better fit for that mid-April sowing. But as we've seen in the past, um, we haven't been able to get it to out-yield the springs. Um, and the reason it's really disappointing is because when we looked at those, say, Planet and Rosalind at the end of October, um, sorry, even towards the start of October, they quite a lot of the tillers had um, you know, almost finished grain filling. And I think they're leaving a fair bit of season out there, um, considering, as has been mentioned, wheat can tend to fill grain right through October and into November. Um, so whether if we can find a longer maturing variety and sow it early and then enable it to keep filling grain through that um, Octo at least October period into November, um, hopefully we can see some benefits. Um, so just to the final slide, just to wrap up, um, in this season, as I mentioned, um, we didn't get huge interactions between variety and management, typically because we didn't get huge um, management responses anyway. Um, spring barley was still the best option, but we can get it better. If we can build higher biomass and then manipulate the yield components, um, I expect we can get better results than what we are seeing in our spring barleys. Um, and as mentioned, it would be nice to have a longer developing option for earlier sowing in WA. And Cassiope, I don't think is the answer because we can't even manipulate its development with sowing date. Um, the other interesting results was despite the low disease, we did see a small fungicide response. Um, and finally, the canopy manipulation treatments that we tried, they weren't very applicable in this tough season because we weren't getting the issues associated with a large canopy. Um, you know, in a much better year, we might see a lot more lodging, um, some intracrop shading and things like that. And that's where we'd expect to see those interactions um, between the canopy treatments and the genotypes. Um, so in the tougher season, the success came with managing inputs um, and not overexposing with, um, you know, costly high nutrition or, or costly um, other applications. And I think I'll leave it there if you just flip to the acknowledgements and I'll just say thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. So does anyone have any questions for Jeremy? Hi, yeah, Jeremy, it's Kirsty Smith here. Hey, Kirsty, far away. Um, your, you mentioned that Rosalind um, had a greater tiller number um, and the planet was really, well, when you're talking about setting up the heads and the grains per, per year, which is where pla planet really drives its yield, what um, exact point does that happen in Bali? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, one that I'm probably not equipped to answer um, from a physiological point of view. So if Kenton or Nick would be able to chime in there, that would be appreciated. 
Um, but I think the key thing that we've seen when we talk about the yield components, we've got to be somewhat careful because they are so interactive in that I, I reckon in that season, given the August rainfall, it wouldn't have surprised me if that's what initiated um, such a great deal more tillering. And those grains per year um, were really quite small. So it's, it's sort of a bit of a, um, the fact that we put on so many tillers also leads to the decreasing grains per year. Um, so again, I'm not exactly sure of um, completely the interactions between the timing. Um, but once again, it's not so simple as if we can just increase um, tiller number, we're going to um, increase yield because, as we said, it compensates with a lower grain number. And some of those Rosalind heads and planet heads were, were really pretty small compared to what we expect in the high rainfall zone. Do you think the, um, do you think the Rosalind being, you know, a short, I was able to put more tillers on late and actually get them through than possibly what the planet was? Um, not sure about, not sure, but typically we have seen that the Rosalind and Latrobe types being pretty compact, um, they generally do have a pretty good harvest index and couple that with the shorter maturity um, is typically why we see them perform pretty well even in some tougher environments. Whereas planet, um, as you'd be no doubt aware, typically likes a longer grain filling period and kind conditions to try and fill the big heads that it has. So. I was just, uh, well, I'll, I'll um, hand over if I may to Kenton in a moment, but uh, one of the great frustrations of um, this year's trials was seeing them on FaceTime with James uh, as opposed to in the flesh. But one of the things it did raise with me, uh, Jeremy, was whether we did actually have two canopies because Rosalind would have been more advanced at the time that we got that rain, i.e. that growth stage 33, was it that we actually had some, what you'd almost call secondary tillers that wouldn't have come to anything that because we had such a thin canopy, in the Rosalind up to that moment in time, we actually had then in Rosalind more light and more opportunity for that second come in, so to speak, um, which would have resulted in a lot of small heads. Um, and I only raise this because we've seen this with irrigation in Tasmania with early sown planet that we've almost had two tiers of, of, of crop. Uh, the primary tillers that you would have expected to deliver the yield and then a secondary tier that came um, be, beyond that. And of course, Rosalind being more advanced might have actually meant that those secondaries had more of a chance to do something than perhaps the planet ones. But uh, any thoughts there? And then I might uh, just ask Kenton if he's got a view on it. But uh, first of all, you know, your thoughts, Jeremy, on that one? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it sounds uh, reasonably plausible. The, the thing that we, I mean, we didn't typically see that there was a clear second flush of tillers, but what was pretty evident was when we went and visited the site in July is although Rosalind and Planet were elongating, they weren't doing it with any great hurry. So they, instead of, you know, sort of moving through the stages quite fluidly, um, you'd see some of the Rosalind plants would be, um, you know, shin height with flat, with ornament, horns coming out, and other ones would sort of be sitting stagnant at about two or three nodes. So there was quite a bit of variation. So, yeah, it, it wouldn't surprise me, um, you know, that it was setting up for um, some less aspirational yields, and then the big flush of rain um, has caused those plants to sort of respond and, and try and increase their yield later. Kenton, any, any thoughts from anything that you've seen? Or in fact, I think we got Blakesley, but Kenton. Um. Yeah. Um, I wonder if we're not, like that dry July has actually done more damage than, than we really think. Like, so barley is actually not that plastic after growth stage 31. So it's, its yield is pretty much determined. So when you look at those plants, they've gone through a pretty hard and dry July and Roslyn's probably just beaten them all to it and got a higher grain yield potential. Um, and I, I don't think 
they really have an opportunity to get any more yield after that point. That, that's one of the biggest frustrations with barley. It's not like wheat where you get late rain and you've got some more upside to yield. So that, to me, I think that dry July is probably has capped yield potential in those slower developing cultivars more than we think. And I think the, um, the biomass story is actually quite interesting. The fact that you're actually getting more biomass from early flowering is, is kind of a little bit unusual. And I think that means like you see in some of our more temperate or milder um, high rainfall zones here, the cultivars that can actually produce more biomass in July and August um, under sort of cold conditions and when evaporation is quite lower, um, are typically Rosalind and those faster developing cultivars. So maybe in the WA rainfall zone, the ability to actually produce more biomass through winter is probably more important than we actually think. Thanks, Canton. I think um, just so we can keep to time, if you're happy, Nick, I think we'll um, move on to Jens now. It's Rachel, can I just ask a question? Sorry, sorry. Can I, Nick, can I just ask a question? The, um, the dry June and then followed by a July where the, the rainfall was pretty low in effectiveness, um, what, what were the differences in soil compaction and, and soil resistance? Uh, say, comparing Esperance and, and the South Stirlings? Do you want to have a go at that? Uh, do you want to have a go at that, uh, James? We took the penetrometer to, we did readings at Esperance, but have we ever compared them to um, Albany? The Green Range site, uh, do you know, James, in answer to John's question? Yeah, no, we didn't, Nick. We didn't do any penetrometer work at Green Range, but I don't think I don't think we had to. And um, John, you might have even seen when you were there at the site for the field day that you could actually see, and you can see it from some of the aerial shots, you can see some compaction lines showing up from when Scott clayed the paddock. Um, so there was definitely a compaction issue there. It showed up in some spots. You could see his old run lines. Um, whereas at Esperance, where we we remove all compaction, I believe, by ripping to 800 and um, its controlled traffic system. So, you know, they've got their heavy trams and that they use year in, year out, and they're not ripped, but then the rest of the site is ripped. So, yeah, there, there was some compaction issues at Green Range, but not at Esperance, if that answers your question, John. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, James. Okay, we'll hand over to you now, Jens, if, uh, if you're ready. Yep, I'm ready. Can you guys see me? I can only see you, Rachel. Now we can see, well, I can see you. You can see me, okay, I'm here. Good. <laughs> Thought I look like you all of a sudden. We've, um, just got a, we've just got a little bit of interference, Jens, again. Um, not sure what it's coming, whether it's a feedback or... That'll be somebody who's not muted, I reckon. That's usually what it is. Is everyone muted? I'll mute it. How are we going now? Does that sound better? Rachel, maybe you can give me a thumbs up if it's, if it's working. Is that all right? Test, test, test. No, that was no different. It's only a little bit of interference. It's not... Okay, I'm not well, sure. we'll just soldier on, shall we? I think so, yeah. Nick. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Okay, yeah. fair enough. All right, everyone mute and I will soldier on. Um, thanks, uh, Nick and Rachel, for the opportunity to, uh, to give you an update on what we've been doing in, uh, from CSIRO perspective in, in Kojana. That's at uh, Ben Webb's place in Quayla. Uh, but before I start, um, I'd like to acknowledge, yeah, it's great. I've really enjoyed working with uh, the FAR team and continuing to work with the DPIRD uh, 
uh, fellows. That's very um, stimulating to work across organisations, get different ideas, different approaches. That's really good, and, and I'm enjoying that. And the other thing I want to do is reiterate something that Nick mentioned. It has been an unusual year. At the beginning of the year, we were debating whether we could have a trial at all, because according to our uh, parent institution, CSIRO, we probably shouldn't. And then they decide, well, yeah, you probably can, but you can't visit it. So uh, as it turned out, we could do that. Uh, and it's thanks to uh, the sterling efforts of Adam, who you can see in the picture here, and uh, Sam Flotman, uh, that we've soldiered on and got some really interesting results uh, through some difficult times, including some changes of personnel. So I want to acknowledge that. I think that was great. Okay, the other thing that I'm going to uh, tell you now is this is not a final report. Uh, I got my last piece of data from this yesterday morning and it's not complete. We've got a whole bunch of yields that we still have to get. So it's a work in progress. And so I'm presenting it to you as sort of, these are, this is what we're seeing. It's a, it's a vehicle for discussion and we'll be discussing this amongst ourselves and I'm looking forward to your feedback. And then when we have all the data, including uh, Jeremy, because Jer as Nick mentioned, Jeremy's also done a bit of canola work in Esperance. Then we'll sit down again and uh, really nut out uh, what we'll do this year. But uh, in the meantime, treat this as a sort of work in progress. This is what we're seeing. And it, we look forward to your feedback on what you think is important, what you think is interesting, because this is a, a, a farmer participatory project. Okay, next slide, please, Rachel. Yep, and click again. Okay, so we've been working in uh, canola in the HRZ for quite some time, and uh, we've seen that yield comes from biomass. So uh, you produce high biomass crops, that's where you get high yield but there's a trade-off against harvest index. So what we mean by that is as you go up in biomass, your harvest index goes down. Um, and that's inefficient and has some other issues, which I'll get into in a minute. And of course, if you want high biomass, you're going to have to put some inputs in as well. But as you know, high input can also equal higher risk, depending on how things pan out. Next one, please, Rachel. Um, high biomass can also be a pain. It, it can be difficult to harvest. It can be difficult to sow into in the next year. Big plants use more water. Some growers consider that high canopy, high biomass crops are more of a sclerotinia risk. Next one. So, you know, we're asking ourselves, what's the optimum? That's one question, but also, what can we do to shift that biomass harvest index trade off? Is there something we can do? Could we grow high biomass crops and get high harvest index? Then you'd really be uh, having your cake and eating it too. And we've discussed this at length with some of the, some of the growers in the Kojanup region. Uh, and they have this fat versus fit crops debate. What do we want? Do we want crops that look really impressive when you go to the field, or do you want crops that yield well at the end of the year? So that's that, that fat versus fit. Okay, next please. Okay, so what do we, uh, what do we set out to do? We wanted to do on-farm trials that would return a wide range of canopy sizes so that we could study that relationship between biomass and yield, which is basically harvest index. And also so that we could look at yield potential in a number of ways. And thanks again to Ben at Quayla, which is, for those of you who don't know, is, is sort of between Cojanup and Boyup Brook, but closer to the, to the Boyup Brook end. It, it's really high rainfall zone, high rainfall zone, if you like. And what we did this year was essentially two experiments. We did experiment one was a factorial agronomy times genetics one and experiment two, a factorial plant growth regulators by dose. So let's talk about those one at a time. Okay, next. 
Uh, just some details, we got 380 mils, which uh, I was surprised to see is lower than you got in, in Albany and in Esperance. It's also lower than the Cogenup mean and the Decile 5. So even though I just said it's the high rainfall zone region of the high rainfall zone, not this year, I guess. I, well, relatively, it was probably okay, but it certainly wasn't a wet year. Okay. Yep, that will do. Temperatures are close to average. Okay, let's talk about the first experiment, which was quite a complicated beast with lots and lots of treatments. So I'm going to go through these one at a time. So we looked at uh, contrasting vigor, and the way we did that was by picking three uh, Roundup Ready hybrids. We know that they tend to be more vigorous against uh, three TT hybrids that we expected would have less vigor and, and it did turn out to be the case. So we've got contrasting vigor. Next, please. Rachel, yep. Uh, we've got contrasting density. So we've got low populations and high populations. Yep, again. We've got different fertility. So we basically had a pretty generous standard grower practice, which was 150 kilos of N with 12 kilos of S against a very high input one, you can see it there. But the N and the S were factorially applied. So we've got different combinations of those. Next. And lastly, we had grazing. So what that was, was essentially plots mechanically grazed prior to bud formation versus ungrazed controls. So all those treatments are factorial. That means we have, for each, uh, variety, we have combinations of density, fertility, which is N by S, by grazing. So you end up with a lot of combinations. And the reason we did that is because we wanted to drive a wide range of biomass, right, wide range of plant heights, a wide range of canopy architectures. Okay, next please. So what results did we get? I'm just going to flick you through uh, a snapshot of these that we have today. Um, so those density and grazing treatments returned a wide range of plant populations, which is what we were hoping for. Uh, we had uh, factorial treatment combinations. They had a very big impact on crop canopy. So if you look at plant height, you can see it, it varied considerably from about 120 to almost 180 centimetres. So that's quite a wide range. And biomass also almost doubled. So that, that means we were successful by giving those factorial combinations, we did end up with different canopies. By far the strongest lever we found was grazing. So we had grazing by canola type, grazing by density interactions. But unfortunately, that data is still uh, waiting to be done because we haven't yet uh, got those ungrazed yields. And because we don't have that, we can't calculate harvest index. So that we'll get them in about two or three weeks. So next, please. So now I'm going to, well, I hope you can see that. That is a bit small. So here's an example of grazing by uh, canola type interactions. You can see that uh, while they both uh, get smaller when you graze them, so uh, plant height gets shorter, uh, the gap between Roundup Ready and uh, Triazine tolerant varieties gets smaller. So in other words, uh, grazing influences or impacts uh, Roundup Ready more than it does TT canola. Next. And if we look at biomass, it's the same story, uh, probably an even bigger uh, impact. So you can see that uh, uh, Roundup Ready really got penalised by grazing more than, uh, than um, uh, TT. Uh, and of course, there's also grazing by density interactions. So I'm just showing you that to show you that uh, with relatively simple agronomic uh, approaches, you can make some fairly big changes to biomass and plant height. Okay, next. Okay, it wouldn't be a canola talk if I didn't show you a principal components analysis in honoring Hepping Zhang here. The reason I do this is because it's a great way to show how how the different uh, traits were associated and how the varieties performed. So what I got here is a graph of vectors. And all you need to look at is 
the angle and the length. So you can see on the right, we have biomass, biomass tons per hectare, biomass grams per plant. They are superimposed. That means those two are really high correlated and they're close to plant height, close to flowering 50, close to a few others. So what essentially what that's saying is as we move to the right, plants have got high biomass, they're tall and they're flowering late. They also have more oil. Uh, and if we go in the opposite direction, uh, we have protein, grain size and plant number. So what that's telling me is that uh, in that trial, my varieties, which I haven't shown you yet, are gonna be separated by biomass, by plant height, by flowering, and going in the opposite direction, protein, grain size, and plant number. And the last thing I want to talk about here is going down the plot, you've got something called machine yield and harvest index. It's going at 90 degrees to those other vectors. What that's saying is that's the next pattern and it's completely uncorrelated to biomass, plant height, and flowering, and the other things I mentioned. And why do I say that? It's because normally when you do variety trials, you'll never see that. You will see the harvest index and yield are very much related to biomass and flowering. And this just shows you how you can break that relationship with agronomy. And that, that's quite interesting to me. Okay, now let's see how the uh, varieties perform. So next click. So that's what, yeah, I just basically said all that. <laughs> Next one. So the first thing, uh, slow, slow down please, Rachel. So the first thing you're gonna notice is that uh, TT and Roundup Ready canolas are separate. So the first uh, black dots that came up, that's GT53. Uh, the next one is another Roundup Ready. Ne another click please, Rachel. And there's the last Roundup Ready. So you can see that most of the Roundup Readies uh, are on the right of the slide and there's very little on the left except for the H4. Uh, 540. Okay, another click. Now here come the TTs. Again, another one and another one. One more click. So you can see all the TTs are on the left and in general the Roundup Ready is on the right. So that means that your Roundup Ready had more biomass, were taller, flowered later, um, and all those things that I just mentioned. But interestingly, the differences in yield and harvest index were not so large. Uh, the highest uh, yielding, highest harvest index was a uh, high tech trophy. Well, I reckon it's disappointing. So despite these big impacts on height, we have no effects on quadrat biomass yield or harvest index. Next, next please Rachel. Yeah, so there's a table of P values and they are supposed to be less than 0.05 if we see differences. And as you can see, none of them are even close. So what that's saying is, despite, despite that we changed the heights, we did nothing to any of the things that, that are important. But I'll draw your attention to the fact that our biomass wasn't huge. It was 11.4 tonnes per hectare. Uh, and Jeremy mentioned earlier that in his uh, uh, barley trial, he didn't see much, uh, much response to uh, uh, defoliation and agronomy. And he put that down to the fact that uh, they couldn't express themselves fully in that growing season. So I'm wondering also if we had a, a better season and we produced more, more biomass, maybe we'd start seeing some, uh, some effects of the PGRs. Okay, next, please. So we did find some detectable effects, but they were invariably negative. So you can actually, if you look at, if you harvest the whole plots, some combinations were actually less than the control. And the same goes for oil and protein. So that's nothing any grower would be interested in. So, so that, that, that was interesting to see. Next. Okay, so what do we conclude and what are we gonna do at this stage? Having not seen the full, full results and having not uh, added Jeremy's work into this yet. I think the message from uh, the first experiment is factorial agronomy works. It, it can manipulate canopy size quite nicely, even in a year where 
you don't get uh, super high rainfall. Yeah, next. Uh, obviously, we're going to complete the ungrazed component uh, uh, and, and analyze that. I think we should repeat it in 2021. Uh, hopefully, we get higher rainfall so we have greater yield potential so we can test these things more thoroughly. Uh, the question that my team's going to be looking at is how can we simplify it? Because I know that uh, Sam's not keen to do another 96 treatments. Uh, we definitely want to put a value on, on grazing. Uh, we didn't do that last time. I think this time we have to do that because we want to also look at this from an economic point of view. And we want to get a handle on how much biomass there was early in the season. Hopefully we do get a different climate in 2021 so that we can look at changes with the seasons and then we can bring in some modeling, which is one of the reasons CSIRO is involved. Next one, please. Uh, with the, uh, the PGR by dose, uh, there's some open questions, I think. Next. Um, I mean, I'm interested in why we can, how we can impact canopy height without infecting uh, harvest index. I think. That quite surprises me. And I'm, I flagged the question, what would happen if, if we had produced more biomass? Would we suddenly see some benefit to the, to the growth regulators? Next. Uh, so what we'd like to do, I think, uh, without having consulted widely with my colleagues, but I think we'll repeat it in, in 20 or 21 with, with luxury treatments, maybe we'll give more, uh, more N and we'll follow plant height more closely over time so we can really see what's going on. And that's all I've got to say for that. If anyone's got any questions, uh, fire ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Jens. See, like Jens said, the full results aren't available yet, but if anyone's got any questions based on what he's presented, unmute yourself and feel free to ask. Rachel, if I can ask a question. Yes. Um, have we got an understanding of how close to the potential yield the actual grain yields were, given rainfall limitation? Yeah, that's a good question, John. No, not yet, but we will do because we'll, we'll model that for sure. That's something we will take up. Hi, Jens. Uh, Brad here. Um, question about nitrogen and the interaction with PGRs. I've, I didn't see any of that there. Do you think that might be a benefit? Um, luxury amounts of nitrogen late in the season to drive biomass after you've affected it by PGR? That's a good idea. Yeah, we could do that. Uh, I'd have to uh, negotiate with Sam. We took some uh, factorial treatments out of the first trial. <laughs> We might be able to add some to the second. That's a good idea. I like that idea. Um, Jens, I guess some of the treatments are built on the premise that more biomass is probably not a good thing. Have you actually ever been able to show that downside risk or blow up canola, so to speak? Yeah, Hepping's got some data where he, um, he shows that, well, depends where you want to put the linear relationship. But he, he reckons once you get more than 10 tonnes, you're starting to, to, to waste it. Um, so we do find when we get up, I think, around 15, it's, it's, it's getting a bit marginal, the return. And that's what we're trying to do here, really push it beyond the, beyond the optimum. Thanks, Jens. Any more questions for Jens before we move on? No? Okay. Thanks, Jens. Um, we'll move on to Nick and James. Does that look okay, Nick? Yes, absolutely fine, um, Rach. Thank you. And uh, good evening again. Um, and like I say, uh, James and I will take you through this presentation. I'll do a little bit at the beginning and 
And please forgive me for co-presenting when I only saw this crop on FaceTime. So I hope you'll forgive me some observations that are based just on uh, uh, images over, uh, over the phone, so to speak. And I'll depend on James and Jeremy uh, to put me right. Um, how far can we push wheat yields? Uh, well, if the results from this year are anything to go by, we've failed miserably and we have a long way to go. Um, in my defense, um, I'd probably say, well, um, it, it wasn't exactly behaving like the high rainfall zone. And I know that some had actually predicted that that might be the case, but um, we're going to take you through some of the wheat results specifically with regards to the farming systems project. Like I say, we concentrated on barley and hyper yielding, probably for good reason when you look at some of the results we've got. So just reminding you again of those two projects uh, with the next slide. It's um, effectively um, based on uh, data that I'll share with you from the Albany end and James will share with you from the Esperance end. And um, I think, like I say, the common theme has been to try and look at some ameliorated effects and then to superimpose our agronomy on top to see what kind of difference it might make. And boy, was the site at Scott's uh, that we set up a year ago uh, with his steer as to where might be a good place. And uh, you can see it beautifully as James has already shown you in this next slide of actually setting up, um, if I may, Rach, the, um, uh, trial, we actually set up two, they're not statistically comparable in the traditional sense, but we set up two identical mirror image trials, um, effectively straddling an unclayed and a clayed area. And uh, the yellow line that you see there clearly demarks uh, between those two trial blocks. And so we straddled the line that um, uh, Scott had in his field from where he uh, clayed in 2017 and then effectively tried to distribute that or smudge as James was describing it earlier. And we set up then um, with a May 1st, 2nd sowing, thanks to Phil and James, um, two identical trials. And what we were after um, was to look at and we planned to go perhaps the week earlier, but uh, we didn't feel we would get any emergence, but we went in May the 1st, May the 2nd, and what we were after was trying to look at wheat that was winter wheat, spring wheat, and then within the winter wheats and the spring wheats, those that were faster to develop and those that were slower to develop. And so you can see that the two identical trials that we set up, 84 plots in each, were based on seven cultivars um, with, of wheat. And we had three springs, the faster one being Scepter and then Pascal and Cutlass, which were slower. And then we looked at four winter wheats, two shorter season winter wheats in Illabo, which is been reasonably taken up, particularly at the Esperance end, looking at a shorter season winter wheat. And we also uh, spend a bit of time uh, with Jeremy talking to uh, Kevin Young about, did he have anything that might be described as a winter sector in the portfolio? And he very kindly advanced uh, some lines and uh, you've got one of those lines there that he felt we should try. The other two winter wheats there are feed winter wheats off of uh, European lists, effectively. They made their way to Australia somewhere in this last five, six years ago. And Annapurna was just sat on the shelf with AGT, possibly as a as a material that might be useful for breeding purposes. They're both red feed weeds. Um, and I know that that might not be 
um, that special for WA, but nonetheless, we were interested to see how their phonology compared. We then very simply put a standard, what we call a standard management, and forgive me, it might be an over the top standard management compared to what happened on a lot of farms in 2020. A standard, a standard with defoliation built in at growth stage 30 in just the same way that Jeremy was describing earlier. And then a high input where we push the N slightly further and we also push the fungicide slightly further. So if we look at those two, those three managements, you can actually see them uh, there in terms of what we did differently. And uh, we were putting some of those applications on and I was saying to James, well, it, it won't work, but let's still carry on and carry that uh, treatment list through. And so, we could be, it could be argued that we should put more N on when we're defoliating, but we wanted to keep that comparison of relatively low levels of uh, input just to see what the effect of defoliation timing might be made at growth stage 30. And it's important to note that we've tried, and it's not always possible to every uh, level of detail, but what we have tried to do is to manage the spring wheats and the winter wheats differently and looking at the winter wheats differently again between the shorter season ones such as illabo and the coded material and the longer season ones such as a crock and an aperna. Fungicides, we started with a product that has We've seen some good results with it in the Eastern States, but I have to accept that it's probably at this moment in time, not as justified in wheat in a West Australian sense, and that's Sustiva. Um, you'll also notice that those other two foliar fungicides carry uh, a QOI or a strobiliorin in radial, which is a mix of epoxyconazole and its oxystrobin. And then following that with Aviator Expro, which is an SDHI mixed with Profiocon and stuff. That was what we set out to look at. And I suppose it'd be fair to say that um, the big differences, as Jeremy's always already inferred, is in the development patterns or the phonology, as we call it. And if we look at this next, uh, slide, what you can see on this slide is that this is a slide that shows you the biomass that we took out of the crop at growth stage 30. And then it, on top of that, instead of carrying the label of how much we took out, which is shown on uh, the left hand with, it says grain yield, but it should be dry matter yield. What it actually shows you is when that crop reached growth stage 30. And so the first thing you see is just what a profound difference there was between when those spring wheats with very little vernalization hold back actually reached growth stage 30 relative to the winter wheat both the short season ones, Illabo and the coded material that reached growth stage 30 at the end of July. And remember the significance of that in terms of the weather pattern versus the two later winter wheats that really didn't get to their growth stage 30 until we were approaching that last week of August. The spring wheats were far more exposed to the effects of the dry June and dry July in particular, in terms of they were stem elongating through that period of uh, July before that rainfall hit um, at the beginning of August. So by the time we actually looked at most of that rain falling on the 4th and 5th of August, what you can actually see is that the winter 
um, wheats were either just approaching stem elongation or in fact had three weeks to go. And one of the things, and a, a, a little like Jens is saying, we've, we've got a lot of data to go through and tabulate. And one of the things that blew me away was this next slide, which um, I was, I'm still um, saying, James, have we, we definitely have got this right, haven't we? And this occurred on the clade and the unclade. And so you've got three colored bars on both trials and it's registering the dry matter at flowering. And why I'm, why I'm actually uh, interested in this is not the green bars, although they're interesting, they show that the, uh, by and large, the short season winters maximize dry matter um, over, uh, the uh, springs by and large and over the longer season winters by and large. So that's the green bars. But what I'm interested in is the blue bars because we know historically that there's a good relationship between what sort of dry matter we have it flowering and then what our subsequent yield is. And so there's part of me looking at the blue bars with a great deal of interest because the winter um, wheats of, you know, they've got their eight to 10 ton of dry matter looking at those clayed ones. Um, but if we compare them to the spring wheats at that stage, um, the spring wheats had hardly any dry matter as they hit that flowering window. And I'll get James and Jeremy to, to, to to comment on this because this really does surprise me uh, that looking at those flowering dry matters, uh, I'm almost to the extent of not believing that we could have got that kind of almost doubling of dry matter by the time we reach the end of grain fill. So that really fascinates me because there's a very significant difference if we're looking particularly at the clade site, where those dry matters are significantly lower at flowering with the spring wheats compared to the winter wheats. What we can see is that perhaps some of that makes sense for us. And we know that those spring wheats were trying to elongate in the harshest of conditions in July. And we know that the winter wheats didn't have to start their stem elongation at that period. Uh, but conversely, the winter wheats then having flowered much later, and I'll come on to the exact flowering dates in a moment, but they then had to endure trying to put grain together in that very hot spell or hotter spell in October as opposed to the shorter season winter wheats, which were late September, early October, and the spring wheats that were trying to put that yield together in September. The problem with, as Jens has always said, a, a, a low yielding year is that you don't get the chance to pull those levers about as much as you want. And if we look at the aerial shot of the site on July 29th, this for me just, I, I was convinced that we would have the most superb set of differential results at, at looking at this trial. You can see um, with some degree of satisfaction that we got the block set in the right place. If you look at the surrounding uh, changes in soil types with the sandbars to one side, but what was really stunning was the apparent visual difference between clade and unclade on the 29th of July. Question is, did it actually yield any different? So if we go to that next picture of, well, what happened on the clade trial? Well, the first thing is to say that there was absolutely no difference, not that they're statistically comparable, 
but they might as well be part of the same trial because there's hardly any difference between them. One trial on the clade ground yielded 3.32 as an average across all of those weeks and all of those managements. The unclade trial yielded 3.5. Well, wow. okay. Management wise, absolutely no difference whether we did standard, standard with defoliation or simulated grazing or high input. In other words, it seemed that whatever green leaf area we had on that dry matter for the 2020 season, it was enough to fill whatever grain potential we had. So no difference in management, but if you then collected those three management treatments together, and then looked at just the cultivar effect, you actually begin to see a different picture emerge. So we had very significant differences. If you move to the next slide, Rach. This is what actually happened when you took out the management effects. And because we had no significant interaction, this is the clay trial first, what you began to see was actually that although the two short season winter wheats reached growth stage 30 at a similar time, uh, Kevin Young's material, uh, the coded material, performed extremely strongly. In fact, it performed very strongly to the extent that the only thing that was in the same uh, window of performance was actually at the other extreme, which was the earliest spring of sector. The longer season winter wheat options, in a similar way to what Jeremy might have said for Cassiope, just haven't performed, but we're still interested that RGT a crock seems to have actually still managed to perform um relatively well considering that it didn't flower until october the 15th and one of the things here is probably picking up scott's point about the first half of november being key for grain fill in other words we still managed to clip more of november with a crock than we did with annapurna if you then look at when these crops flowered, I've not identified them specifically, but in this next slide, what I want to, and in all due respect, the site logistics haven't been easy for us in this last year. So these are approximate estimated growth stages of when we think that these crops might have flowered based on the visits that we've made at those times. I think they're broad enough that even if they're not spot on, they actually show something really interesting. And that is that, and the unclaimed trial really isn't uh, any great deal different to that. So this is firstly, the blue bars are the spring wheats and scepter is the earliest of those to flower. And I put its yield there um, to just remind you of how it did, which was one of the highest yielding varieties. But when you then went to Pascal and Cutlass, they were lower performing. And we have to say we were surprised with the Pascal performance. And James and Jeremy might comment on that a little later. But the first, as far as we can work out, looking at what we've got, actually the first of our winter wheats to flower uh, was actually the coded material. And that came in in that last week of September. The Illabo shortly after that. So in that last week of September. And the thing that really fascinates me 
is, well, is wheat not yielding because nothing sits in that giant chasm between spring wheats and the earliest season winter wheats? Or am I just actually clutching at straws? If you then move to those late season winter wheats, you can see that the last to flower was a crock. And like I say, generally speaking, they've been disappointing, but a crock does seem to be rather interesting in terms of how it puts you together. The other thing that fascinates me there is that's still quite a spread in flowering if we're saying that we need to have a season whereby we escape heat and we escape frost and we want the best of both worlds there because there's still quite a wide band of yields between the coded short season winter wheat and sector. So I raise all kinds of questions. We can't think from looking at the data from the nearest weather station that frost played a significant part. We know drought played a significant part either side of that massive rainfall event probably uh, heat as well, but I'm still left saying there's plenty of possibility for looking at different phenologies when you look at that chart. If I then move to the unclay just for completeness, there's a lot of variation. You can see from those aerial shots that getting tight CVs and, you know, James and Jeremy and Phil in setting all of this up, they've done an amazing job to even get the statistics to give us anything that's significant when you consider how variable the germination was. But this final picture is almost exactly the same, you might say, in many respects, particularly with the Cody wheat. Um, but the thing that fascinates me is that the acroc has now come up again. Now that's either because of that November rainfall or it's because of some way that a croc, which from talking with Kenton earlier, we were talking about a croc because a croc, as with us in hyper yield in cereals in Tassie, got the capability of hitting 16 tonne a hectare. So we know it's got the upper legs. What's amazed us is that it can actually do this kind of performance at three and four turn when you consider when it flowered. So either it was just a stroke of luck, but recapping before handing to James, clayed and unclayed looked massively different. And in a, any other kind of season, perhaps it would have given us the differences that we might have expected through seemingly better establishment, better germination, but it didn't. Management gave us very little effect, which I can only conclude that at 11, 12 tonne a hectare max, it didn't really matter because we had enough biomass to satisfy that kind of yield. And I, but I am fascinated by the fact that it hasn't been a very tight flowering period that's given us the highest yields in this particular case. So rather like Jens, I'm, I'm really keen to look at this, the long season wheats. I've had my wings clipped um, and James will perhaps now show you why, because we sowed here on May 1, but in Esperance, we were on the money in the 16th and we had the moisture to bring it up so at that moment i'll hand to james uh, i've probably gone over time enormously my apologies uh, rachel over to you james thanks nick yeah so as you can see with these two photos it's very visual of how affected the esprin site was by the wind events so Admittedly, we sowed into really good moisture. The site had good moisture the whole year. It was never, the crop never looked thirsty, but it was certainly affected 
by the wind. So as you can see here, 6th of May, a lot of you would remember, had some shocking weather. Um, I believe the wind was about 86, 88 k's an hour recorded at Esperance Airport on the 6th, um, which was, yeah, our, as you can see from the picture on the right, the crop was up and about. It was healthy. Um, and then we almost got complete furrow fill from that wind event, the sand blow that came across the site. So the crop virtually had to re-germinate, which I think put the winters at a big disadvantage, um, particularly in the barley, as Jeremy was saying that he was quite disappointed from the results of the Urambi. I think Urambi looked really good. It germinated quickly after sowing, but then because it was so buried from this wind event, it um, didn't quite have the vigour to get going again like the springs did like the Nitro and Rosalind and Planet. Um, once again, there wasn't any frost events at the site. Uh, Gibson East, where the site is, we are pretty safe with frost. Um, I believe two years ago, most of the Esperance port zone got smashed by frost, but the farm we were on did not get affected by frost that year on that block. So yeah, we're, um, we were lucky again in that scenario. So on the next slide, Raj, just looking at the wheats, so similar cultivars to what Nick was referring to at Albany, where we had a couple of springs in Cutlass and Scepter. Once again, we had a coded line from Kevin Young, along with Illabo as our shorter winters. And then we had Bennett, a croc and Annapurna as our longer winters. Um, as you can see from the yields, I think it's all quite respectable of what you'd expect to see. The grazing reduced all of the yields a little bit. Um, we did have some grazing data that came off those. Um, so they're all grazed at Z30 and for Illabo, Bennett and Youngie, that was on the 24th of, Ju 24th of June, sorry, where we removed approximately 750 kilos to the hectare of biomass. And they had approximately 1.1 to 1.4 tonnes of the hectare of biomass at that stage at Z30, as opposed to the likes of the winters. Oh, sorry, I'm just to speed. The winters, so a crock and Annapurna, we removed over a tonne and a half to the hectare, and they both had two over two tonnes for the hectare um, at Z30 which was towards the end of July for those two. Next slide, Rich. So as you can see here on the ripped and spaded ground, um, these are our dry matter at harvest. They were significantly different um, and the higher end was associated with that higher dry matter. Um, and you can see the heads per meter squared there in the, in the, the um, columns. Thanks, Raj. So as I mentioned earlier, the soil amelioration for our small plots, we deep ripped it only to 400, um, just because we were slightly worried about <laughs> getting a little tractor bogged and we didn't want to rip the guts out of it. So it was only ripped to 400. And then it was spaded to approximately three to 400. And then it was rolled to um, get a good seed bed. Whereas our larger amelioration blocks where we had an in-crop nutrition trial and a disease trial, which were both commercially sown to Illabo. Um, you'll see later in the slides that we had three treatments there. Picture on the left there is Nick looking at um, what's just been deep trip with Jordan Whiting. Next slide. Alrighty, so this is a bird's eye just after sowing before the wind event. So you can still see the nice neat run lines. Up the top in the yellow box is our small plot area where we had a wheat management trial, a barley management trial, and a second time of sowing, which is in the top left of that box, which hadn't actually been sown yet. And then down the bottom, you can see three boxes, three treatments outlined. 
approach. So our three treatments were the paddock itself was deep ripped to 600 in 2019. So that was our control. We also then had another rip in 2020 where it was ripped to 800, purely going deeper because they had more horsepower to get the ripper deeper. And then we also had a spade seed. So it was double ripped and then spade seeded with the Illabo with a Farmax machine. Thanks, Rach. So in regards to the yield response, we only saw a 450 kilo increase from the double ripping, um, someone with a time machine. Um, early in the season, that difference was quite visual, but then the biggest difference was our disease, our weed pressure, sorry, with the spading and what that brought. Um, the farm knows, and I guess the general industry knows that you're going to stir up a lot of weed seeds with the ripping and spading. Uh, we were stirring up barley from three seasons ago that was germinating, but predominantly it was the rye grass pressure that the spading brought and then how you try and manage that throughout the season. So there on your left, you can see our three amelioration techniques with their average yields. You can see that the double rip and then sown with the tine machine was the highest yielder. And I definitely think that the spade seeder, some of that yield was impacted by the ryegrass pressure and some of our um, lack of control of that ryegrass just because of the issues that it caused. And you could see that throughout the whole season. Um, you can also see that there was a significant um, difference in the protein, but not in the test weight or screenings of those three blocks. Thanks, Raj. And there's two pictures of Scott's site again. Um, so yeah, that's about it for me. Any questions? No questions? Oh, thanks, Nick. Thanks, James. Um, we are running a little bit behind, so I'm going to move on to Phil's presentation. Um, okay, Phil? Yep, all good. Yeah, afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, as Nick stated at the start, I'm sort of running uh, the Ward Paddocks and Focus Farms for WA. Uh, this year... I'll talk about the ward packs again, but this year we had four focus farms, uh, one in South Stirlings, one at Kendon up and two out at Franklin. Uh, so I've got the next slide. Thanks, Richard. Uh, so at South Stirlings, we had a late nitrogen. Um, it had a control strip and high strip um, with an extra 100 kilos placed on that high strip uh, at about the flag leaf emergence on the 30th of August. Uh, had 77 units of nitrogen before that. And the most noticeable frost that sort of hit the paddock uh, was the 6th of October. Uh, it didn't affect the majority of the trial. Uh, it affected one end, but we cut that off in yield mapping. So didn't affect the results. Uh, next slide, thanks. So we had no significant differences in the peak biomass harvest, biomass and the head counts. Um, that was all both eight ton, uh, 14 ton and around the 400 mark. And then for the proteins, there was no significant difference, but for the yield, there was a 400 kilo increase from that extra nitrogen. Uh, so that's that one. Next focus farm we had was out at Franklin. We tried a foliar K at about flag leaf. Um, we used the locomotive one with a control strip of five litre per hectare strip and a 10 litre per hectare strip. Uh, before the treatments went out, it had 37 units of K that season. And the paddock was again, a little bit frosted at the start of October, uh, with not heavy patches, it just more took the top of the yields off. Uh, once again, there was no significant differences in any of the dry matter cuts or head counts. The differences in that head count mostly came from the paddock variability. 
um, in our measurements. Uh, again, there was no significant differences out of the proteins that we detected, um, but there was a significant decrease in the yield for the high rate at 10 litres a hectare. It was a bit surprising. Uh, we couldn't say that that would be an expected treatment response. So whether that did come down to maybe the frost touching one side of the trial. Um, at the next farm, thanks. Uh, so we had another nitrogen trial out at Franklin. Um, this one included a scepter and a catapult factor, and both had a control and a high strip, which the high strip had an extra 44 kilos of urea or 20 units at the 14th of August. Um, had 92 units of uh, nitrogen before this, and it wasn't affected by frost at all. Um, it was one of our highest yielding paddocks for this season. So I'll grab the next slide. Uh, there was no differences in your harvest biomass at all, even between the um, scepter and catapult, even though catapult was a slightly longer season that was sown at the same time. Um, your head counts, there was no significant difference, even though the catapult had slightly higher than your scepter. Uh, there was no differences in your yield and proteins either. Um, you did tend to gain the two to 300 kilos out of that extra nitrogen, uh, even though it wasn't significant though. And yeah, proteins were slightly higher in your sectors. Um, and it just, we don't believe it was a high enough treatment to get a response over the variation across the plots. Uh, Kendon up, we had a pretty complicated trial at seeding that we used. Um, we broke this down into three parts. So we had a low fertilizer, um, which only had 63 kilos of compound at seeding. Uh, then you had your three seeding rates in that. So 60 kilo, 120 kilo, which is considered the control and 186 kilos. And that was the same for a high fertilizer part, which had 189 kilos of the compound. Uh, and that was a break. The compound's a breakup of uh, ag flow, magnes, uh, map and a mop blend. We then had a normal fertilizer um, part to it, but that only had a control and a no flexian uh, with fungicides and SC14 included in that. Uh, that was just to see what impact the flexian that's usually put out at seeding would have. Uh, there was a slight frost again at the start of October that probably took the yeah, top of the cream off the yield. Um, it has a medium to sort of high PBI at this sort of 156. Um, so that sort of comes into your P rates and your low fertilizer was your 10 units of P, high fertilizer at 30 units of P and your controls at 20 units of P. So for the low fertilizer part of the trial, um, there was no significant differences in head, uh, your biomass and your head counts. Again, um, you had a, your uh, peak biomass and your harvest biomass did decrease when you decrease your seeding rate. Um, obviously your control rate of seed at 120 was best uh, at your low fertilizer rate for those measurements. And you could see your head count did increase um, as you went up in your seed, but that didn't correlate perfectly with yield um, as there was no significant differences in changes in yield or protein again, um, but your 60 kilos did have slightly lower yield, uh, about 600 kilos lower than your control rate of seeding. Um, so yeah, it's just normal normal uh, 120 kilos of seed at your low fertilizer rates adequate. Next Good question, Phil. Did you yeah. um, see any differences in germination with the likes of SE14 in amongst that? Because uh, the only treatment that didn't have the SE14 was in that no flexi one. Uh, which I'll get to at the end. Uh, didn't didn't do anything at seeding because the project sort of started up in July, uh, August. So catching up with a few of our trials, and this one was done at seeding uh, previously by farmer. So it was a case of nothing was actually measured at seeding time. So the head, I'll look at the head counts and see what sort of comes out of that. No worries. Um, so at your high fertilizer rate, uh, there was no significant differences in anything. Again, um, you had a somewhat increase in your peak biomass, especially when you went to your high seed rate. Um, 
and your actual had your lowest harvest biomass in your normal uh, control seeding rate. These again didn't correlate at all to your yields as your highest peak biomass and highest harvest biomass was actually your lowest yielder. Um, and then your control uh, was your control seed rate at your high fit uh, was your best yielder uh, out of the whole trial at your 5.1. So it sort of sort of indicates that yeah, 120 is adequate to be able to for all your fertilizer rates. Um, you could probably decrease it if you're trying to save on costs a bit, um, probably to 80 to 100. Not as we haven't done that, so there's not evidence to confirm it. But out of these results, it would indicate that it wouldn't pay too much of an impact on you. Go to the next slide, thanks, Frankie. And then this is our yeah, normal fertilizer uh, rate, and we just had the control, which had your normal seeding rate, normal fert rate and normal flexi, which is your 50 litres. And then we just had your yeah, flexi and fungicide and uh, wetter turned off. Um, so there's no difference in any of this again. Your peak biomass and harvest biomass were pretty much the same. Yield counts were the same. It tended to be that your um, sl maybe slightly less uh, plant germination would probably tiller that little bit more and counteract with the head count. So it turned out roughly similar. Um, yeah, to your answer, James, I didn't see much of a response. It was pretty hard to tell between treatments other than low seed, low fert ones. Um, the biggest difference you saw between all of them, especially with seed, was um, your stem thickness. And that's what varied between it. So your high rates of seed and fert tend to have really small stems versus a low seed rate with high fert. Um, so you had no significant difference in yield here, uh, but you did end up with 500 kilo increase from that um, extra flexi and fungicide and wetter, um, and a slight bit more protein as well. I took all the treatments through to calculate a gross margin out um, to count. So you took into a factor all the cost of at the seeding of different compounds, different uh, flexies and seeds and worked it out to be the control roughly about thousand dollars and then worked the rest out to be percentages um, so the only one that was high yielding was the high fert not that it was significant it was yeah nothing was significantly higher and that was yeah sixty dollars more um, that's about it the, the rest you're spending a uh, bit more money and not getting your return back um, this Significant differences in this one was only between your low and high rates of fertilizer within the same seeding rate. So for example, this is gonna be your low and high ferts of your low seeding rate or your low and high ferts of the high seeding rate. So. For the award paddocks for this upcoming season, we're looking for paddocks again. Um, for any farmer that wants to get involved or agronomist that is willing to get farmers that um, put foot paddocks forward or want to be included. Um, just most farmers already collect the data and it's just as simple as handing it over uh, and putting it anonymously into, anonymously into a portal. Um, you'll just have a soil test, your paddock records of all you can for, um, you'll have a mid flowering and biomass cut uh, you have yield components of your head counts, grains per head, all that sort of stuff done. You get well, looking for some accurate yield information that is sort of verified and you'll get grain testing as in a physical and a nutrient uh, form that will come out of it. What the farmer gets out of it is going to be a personalised and anonymous agronomic benchmarking report. So it should have all the factors compared him or her against the other leading um, farmers in the region and seeing where you can improve and what you can do better in the next season to increase your yields and profits. There will also be awards for the highest yield and highest percentage yield of the potential for that specific paddock. Um, that will be coming out later this year for the pre previous season and uh, continue on for each year. That's Thanks, it. Phil. Thank you. So, yeah, if you do want to get involved in the Focus Farms on the, all the awards next year, Phil is the man to contact and his contact details are there 
on the slide and they're also on, on the uh, hyper yielding crops page of the Fire Australia website. So thanks, Phil. Does anyone have any questions for Phil? Can I ask a question, Rachel? Yep, go for it, John. Uh, yep. I just wonder how the uh, water use efficiency stood up, Phil, on those uh, award paddocks or the focus paddocks. How close were they to the potential? Uh, yeah, I don't. The paddock or you know, the uh, agronomic reports haven't been made yet, so I, we haven't actually finished finalising all the data getting it off farmers. So um, on, yeah, we're getting at the end of that ourselves. And then um, John Midwood will be working on doing the stats analysis and getting a reports all done. So no, yeah, no results have actually come out of those award paddocks yet. Or, or the, well, the focus farms, we didn't have um, any of the water use efficiencies calculated yet either. It's just working off the main results out of yield. Perhaps that's some, something we can share when you do have those results, is it, Phil? Yes, yep. Yeah, no, when we yeah, final, finalise all the results, it'll be um, summarised and put out. So. I'll happily forward those on to you, John. Okay, are there any other right. questions for any other presenters um, before we close today's session? I think Julianne had one in the chat, which I've just realised. Um, yeah, here we go. House farms. And Julianne, thanks, Will. Good wrap up. How many house farmers are you thinking of for the award paddocks and for Esperance and Albany, or at this stage, just Albany? Uh, we're looking for at least 10 growers to be a part of the award paddocks. Um, we based out of Albany sort of limited in where we can reach we are more than happy to have uh, partnerships with agronomists if they want to supply the data they can have as many ward packs as they want um, because like, they'll be supplying there's not too much work in it at all uh, most agronomists have all the data for farmers so it's a case of if we can work together with um, farmers and agronomists in Esperance um, in the Albany region, um, yeah, we're happy to do the same and yeah, be able to travel out there. Otherwise, we yeah, can work on what's capable. I perhaps, Rach, just make a quick comment there. It is something that um, we're hoping, we're obviously at the fledgling stage and uh, Phil and um, is, uh, we're, we're trying to gather the information, then process it so that those award uh, benchmarks that uh, Phil talked about the report should actually give um, I think Phil is it something like 40 different parameters that you're hoping to be able to uh, get out of that report relative to those other entries that have come in is that correct? Uh, yeah I haven't heard too much about all the parameters I know there's certainly a lot uh, in it um, John's still yeah, working on finalising a, a plan and a draft. Um, but yeah, there's all the, all the soil aspects of your carbons, um, everything included in that test. You come down to yield components of um, yeah, heads, grains per head, um, harvest biomass, peak biomass. Um, there's a huge, huge range of what goes into it, even in your group grain nutrient analysis. You've got your nitrogen, um, nitrates goes down to aluminium and all boron rates out of your grain. So there's a large potential of what information could be pulled out of it. So I think the, the exciting thing is that if we can capture the imagination, it's not tall poppy syndrome. We're not wanting to um, talk. Uh, if this was a competition over the highest yields, then I'm afraid there's some Tasmanians that probably stand a very good chance. In fact, we've harvested our highest barley yields today in Tasmania, but we've only harvested them today. And, um, you know, we're hopeful that they're in excess of 10 tonne barley crops. So it's not just about the highest yield. We've actually got John Kierkegaard working in the project behind 
what John and Phil are doing regionally um, in order to try and establish uh, yield potentials for the different regions so that not only we can talk about how well one might be doing in a particular region in terms of absolute highest yield, but also considering the fact that I, if I was to give any awards, I think uh, looking at the research sites, it would be to James and uh, Jeremy for doing six ton of barley uh, at Green Range this year. So it's not just about absolute highest yield, it's about highest yield of potential. And so because yield potential, particularly where you have water logging, um, which is a common feature of many high rainfall zone regions, because of things such as that, it becomes very difficult to just apply the French and Schultz kind of a, a approach to yield potential. And so we've got John Kierkegaard working, um, looking at both water limited yield potential, as well as what we call PTQ limits or photothermal quotient looking at that combination of heat and uh, light, a solar radiation, prior to the flowering period to see if those kind of formulas can be applied to uh, our common high rainfall zone regions. And it's already led to some interesting uh, aspects of some of our research results in that John Kierkegaard said that our southern New South Wales site actually had some of the highest yield potential in the 2020 season. And um, of course, being further south and in the high rainfall zone, I rather poo-pooed the, uh, the expectation that Southern New South Wales could beat Southern Victoria or Southeast South Australia. Um, but um, they're very much uh, nip and tuck at that sort of 10 and a half, 11 tonne in the wheat uh, sphere. So it's producing some dividends for us to be able to try and get a handle on yield potential in these HRZ zones. So if you're interested, do get in touch with Phil. We're trying to expand it out. Um, and if anybody's interested in looking at uh, other schemes like this, then perhaps look up the Yen Awards, uh, the Yield Enhancement Network in the UK, and you'll have a similar ideal as to what we're uh, trying to achieve with it. So uh, if you think that you'd like to enter a crop in uh, 2021, then uh, get in touch with uh, Phil. Uh, thank you, Nick. So are there any more questions before we wrap up? If you if you do think of anything post the session, then please feel free to email them through to me and I'll try and get them answered for you. Um, I think you should all have my email address now. So um, that's another option. Well, thanks again for joining us. And um, we're very sorry we can't join you for a beer and supper tonight, aren't we, Nick James? And yep. <laughs> hopefully later in the year, um, if we can get down to you for the, uh, for the awards, we can do it then. Um, so I'd just like to thank the presenters again. So um, Jens, Jeremy, Phil, Nick, James, um, thanks for your contributions this evening. And of course, to all the project partners as well for the high rainfall zone farming systems and hyper yielding crops. Um, thanks also to um, our host farmers, um, the Whiting family, Scott Smith, and I'm not gonna forget to thank your wife this time, Alana, <laughs> so thank you. And, uh, and of course, to Ben Webb at Quail Up as well. And um, importantly, thanks to the GRDC for um, funding these um, projects. So yeah, I think we'll wrap it up there. Thanks again for joining us and um, enjoy the rest of your evening all. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Thanks very much. Thanks okay, right, bye for now. See you later. Thanks, Rachel. Okay, bye. <laughs>